Over 50, You Are Not Done Yet is a podcast documenting the lives of Americans 50 and over. They are artists, musicians, performers, authors, teachers, and coaches. Their stories are your stories. Their lives, their legacies, and the people they've touched are all inspiring. Listen as they open their hearts and share their passions. I'm Nadine O, and you're listening to the Over 50 You Are Not Done Yet show, a podcast documenting the lives of Americans 50 and over, and their stories are your stories. Today, I would like to honor the life of author Thomas J. Hickey, who passed away late November 2019 at the age of 101. I learned so much from my conversations with Tom. I would love to share one with you right now. This was from our very first interview taken by phone a few years back. Please enjoy. Who is Tom Hickey today? about that. That's great. And how old will you be? How young well, will you be? Well, I'll be 97, 97 years. Uh, only my, my one daughter says, oh, Dad, that means you're, you'll be in your 98th year. <laughs> I say, oh, yeah, give me a break, give me a break. I'll be 97 in October the 14th. Well, congratulations. Thank you. Turning 97... Uh, there's, you're marking something else too, as well. Not that it is not a great thing, but also you have a book out. Yes, uh, this will be my th- third book. I'm, I'm trying to write uh, one per year. Mm-hmm. For example, in uh, 2013, I, I wrote a book about uh, about the uh, uh, the year I spent in India during during the during the big war, and and. Uh, that's, uh, that was just 1945 and 46. Uh, and then the second book was about, primarily it's about uh, my father and mother and how they managed to get through the Great Depression. That was Surviving the Great Depression, One Family Story, correct? Uh, yes, that's right, exactly right. Mm-hmm. And so now this, uh, this third one for, for 2015 is, uh, well, it's 10 lessons that I've learned in my Nearly 100 years is a is a title, and that's uh, <laughs> my one daughter said. Is that, you only learn ten lessons in all those years, and I said, <laughs> no. Well, these are ten specific lessons that I've learned that I'd like to write about. Is there one that you could share with us today that could perhaps inspire others who are reaching retirement? or who are in retirement? There are, there are several. Let me, let me uh, think of one. Uh, okay. Well, one I'd, I'd be glad to read, uh, to read it if you like. It's about... Uh, oh, sure. About, about using your talents. That, that's uh, that's the, the lesson I'm, try, I'm sort of giving myself. And uh, Let me read it for you. At age 18, just out of high school, and the family had just moved to Allentown, I answered a newspaper ad for salespeople because I needed a job. And this sales was for real silk hosiery for women. 
so for a week I tried that. I did cold, cold sales and, and didn't, didn't get a nibble. And then my father said to me, Tom, there are some things you and I can't do. Well, I resented that. I thought, don't include me with that negative approach. I, the young guy, so I, no, I just told, but then I stopped selling it so cozy because I had no luck the second year. So uh, it was many years later, to a few uh, successes and many mistakes, that I realized what Dad was really advising me. And it said, it's this, Tom, make time, take time to learn what you're good at and you what you're not. Concentrate your energies on what you're good at and ignore the other. Now, I, I thought that was uh, excellent advice, and I, I think in terms of uh, Flannery O'Connor, the great uh, writer, they asked, they asked Flannery, why do you write? And she, she, she said, well, I write because I enjoy it, and I'm good at it. Mm-hmm. And so that's pretty much what my father was telling me. What you're, what you're good at, stay with and ignore, ignore the other stuff. Well, you know, when I first started this, uh, in fact, for the first book, as far back as then, with, the, with my good friend Joaquin Bowman, and I said at that time, you know, who cares? You know, who cares what I think or what I did? And Joaquin says, "Well, your children will. She, he will. They will care. And so with the, their children, they will care. And so let, let, let's uh, let's do this uh, with them in mind. And that is what I have been doing." Yes, and and you know the the. The great thing is I had the opportunity to interview Joaquin as well, and he spoke so very highly of you and was really excited about your latest book as well as proud about the other books you have written. And I know you had mentioned um, the book about your journey to India, and I just wanted to let the listeners know that that was Tom Hickey's India, 1945 through 46, A Soldier's Diary. That's exactly right. It it seems like you have been pulled towards telling your story from the very beginning, which I just think it's a theme that's just sort of a continuation. And I I wonder if other, other people out there listening or friends of those listening... Uh, know that how important it is to tell our story and not wait for someone to ask. Oh, no question. It, there is, and I, I've been blessed with uh, uh, with people encouraging me to to. to uh, for example, my primary physician mm-hmm. uh, some some years ago, Doctor Tumas, uh, mm-hmm. he said, "Write it, write it, write it, write it." <laughs> he encouraged me to. Uh, that was the, the story about India, that, uh, sure. because it was a, a very critical uh, uh, point for uh, India at that time. Uh, the war, both the war here and, and against Japan, mm-hmm. uh, were, were ending, and India was pushing for their independence from the United Kingdom. A very critical time, and uh, for, for me, it was. So it was a fun time because I'm watching all this uh, sort of thing and the war was over. So uh, mm-hmm. it turned out to be a rather e- easy book to write and, and I'm glad I did it. During your time in India, what would you say was the most impactful thing that happened to you? Uh, yes, I, I think um, well, what encouraged me most uh, was getting to know the Indian people and loving them. Mm-hmm. Like they were great. And uh, now... There was a great deal of poverty uh, there that, sure. that uh, I would, I, you know, just it was just part of this part of this uh, of, the, of the landscape uh, that, that I didn't pay too much attention to it. I, I was I was more interested in and in, involved with the uh, uh, the, uh, the demonstrations and 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 politics of, of what was happening in India at that time in order to. In order to get their 
independence. And, and, but, and so I think what I remember most about it is, is, is the, uh, how, how fondly I became uh, uh, involved in the Indian people, including, including Anglo-Indian people that uh, I got to know pretty well. More information on Tom Hickey can be found in our show notes and on our website at over 50 you are not done yet dot com. I really like the Indian people. They have a sense of humor. They're, they're quiet, and yet they, you know they uh, they can act uh, uh, encouragingly, but not as as Gandhi, Mahatma Gandhi, uh, has said. You know, just so without violence. Well, it's called a non-violent resistance, which is what, what he promoted. Uh, one, one incident uh, I remember particularly, I, 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 you know, I was a court reporter, a court stenographer at, uh, oh, in really? India. And, uh, wow. And, and so that, that put me at the top, at the top level of people uh, constantly. Mm-hmm. And... I was in uh, in New Delhi at at one time, and uh, they had an opportunity to uh, well uh, to get a, I get a break every so often, and I was taking a little walk through New Delhi, which was a beautiful beautiful uh, park section of it, and very quiet, and uh, uh, walking along at, at, in the back of a very, very high stone. Uh, fences were for mansions, and uh, I was passing by the driveway of one of them, and the big iron gates were open, and a limousine was coming, coming out, but uh, two drivers in the front, and then someone, someone in the in the back, mm-hmm. and uh, uh, so I stood right there at, at the driveway, and let it pass, and it paused for oh, just a matter of a few seconds. I was checking the street for traffic, and there really was very little traffic. But they they stopped for just a few seconds, and that gave me a chance because right there at at my at my face was a this person who was alone in in the back back seat of back of the uh, of the of the van, mm-hmm. and uh, and I looked at him. And he looked at me and sort of just nodded to each other. And then the, the car pulled, pulled away. And at that point, I realized who that was in there. And who was it? Was, it? it was Mahatma Gandhi. And, and that, you know, that, that made, as far as the Indian people, that made me a practically a saint. Did you subscribe yet? What are you waiting for? Subscribe. Look for the button below. Can we talk about your book on surviving the Great Depression? I did get a chance to read it. It definitely was a family story. And I can tell you there were some nuggets in there that stuck with me, like the wagon when you were a kid making money and the car. What was the car you named the car? Popeye. I thought that was uh, really cute. But I, and I also love the Philadelphia Allentown connection. And I think those who live on this side of the coast would um, get a sense or a feel like they were walking down um, the street. Uh, Surviving the Great Depression. Why did you decide to write that book? Mm-hmm. And mother uh, during that depression. Now, what, what had happened? That they, they were two. They were a little couple from from a very little village outside of Worcester, Massachusetts. And and through a a, a brother, uh, an uncle of mine, they decided they decided to leave uh, leave that. There were not, no opportunities in the little village except a couple of the textile mills. And so in order to get away from that, my father 
that moved to, and he moved down to Philadelphia, where he worked in the mill, but, but also he was, he was seeking other opportunity. Sure. Well, uh, at, at one point, um, uh, at one, one point, he, he, he had learned how to be a waiter, and uh, after some years uh, as a waiter, he, he, he found an opportunity to buy a little restaurant of his own, which he did in, in West Philadelphia. A little, uh, and he learned, and he, he ran, ran the restaurant, but doing very well with it. And, uh, and, and suddenly, and then at one point, we, we were, he, he, he got us into a restaurant uh, where we lived upstairs, and so that just put the whole family together. Mm-hmm. And, and then, of course, the depression came. Mm-hmm. And uh, he, all of the original family business that he had in the restaurant, that just vanished. People couldn't couldn't eat out, couldn't have dinner out. And, sure. and so the depression really killed him. Mm-hmm. And he had, to, he had to get out of that business. And we moved into a, a rented house a few blocks away, but and then he was looking for work, and he would work in, in the uh, bars that were uh, getting ready for business the next day. At one time, he uh, he went to a, a restaurant that was still open up on Transdown Avenue, and they said, well, yeah, yeah, we could use you tonight over the dinner table sure. at dinner time, sure. uh, but for tips only. Mm-hmm. So he worked that night for... for uh, <laughs> When he came back, he, he gave uh, he gave my mother all of his tips, uh, three nickels and a dime. And so, you know, uh, somehow we struggled, struggled through. He, he saw Christmas trees at one time, and he had lost uh, some of some of his money because the bank said closed on him. Yeah. And, and uh, but he never went on the dole. In fact, my my mother wanted to go on the dole for to feed us three kids. But and he walked away. He simply he would not go on the dole. He was too too proud. He was going to do this on, on his own for his own. So in 1932, he took the, he took a job in a hotel trailer up in Allentown, and then. Uh, uh, I worked there, came home every weekend for three years. Right. And, uh, and it took him two and a half to three hours just each trip. And many of the time, I, on Sunday when he's ready to go back home, I would walk him to the trolley car at mm-hmm. the corner, realize he had another two and a half hours before he would get to Valentine. Right. So uh, oh, anyway, that was the story. Now, he stayed there until... Uh, and, 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 and it was my senior year at the, at, at high school, and I was doing pretty well. Now you went um, you went to what high school? At, at the West Catholic West Philadelphia Catholic High School at, for boys. Right now you uh, you did pretty good in high school. Yeah, yes, I did. As a matter of fact, uh, <laughs> my senior year, I I wrote uh, some stories for, for their uh, for the school publication. Mm-hmm. And uh, and uh, that yes, you know, sort of got me it's interested in writing anything, and uh, so my mother wanted me to finish, wanted us to stay in Philadelphia until I until I finished high school, mm-hmm. and uh, since I was doing so well, and uh, so three days after I graduated, I'm on a on a moving truck up up and that's when after. Since 1932, that's when my my father finally got us up into Allentown, and he stayed with her trailer for some years. And... Right. What's your story? What's your song? Finding it and singing it is definitely worth the journey. Remember, every moment in life is a gift. How you spend it is up to you. Uh, during that time, was there a song that you listened to that you really liked? Uh, radio was just coming in at that time. Right. And, uh, of course, nowhere near television, but just radio. Sure. And we were fortunate enough to get a radio. But, uh, you know, you get, you get no bread with one meatball, you know. <laughs> and, 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 and there was a 
What advice would you have for them about um, embracing the the second stage of their life? Uh, I, I can I can only say that uh, that's from the vantage point of, of where I am right now. Mm-hmm. And uh, in, in the earlier years, I used to worry about uh, who am I and where am I going and what, what's what's uh, this. And, and uh, at the moment now, at, at my age and my my situation, I I have a very comfortable a room with with my son and a, a, and one of my daughters is financially taking care of taking care of, the, of my being here. For those approaching retirement, aside from putting aside money, what advice would you have for them about um, embracing the the second stage of their life? God wants me here, and here I am. And what am I to, to do with my life? Well, God gave me a gift for ability to write. Mm-hmm. He gave that to me, so I could give that back to me. Uh, some people can sing, some people can play music, but all I can do is write, and so, but, and, and that's what I do. And uh, for some reason, uh, opportunities come. Well, here's, here's what I have to do. And I, and I, that keeps me busy, keeps mm-hmm. me active, and it's just, this is, uh, this is my life now. This is, this is my, uh, my mission. Well, it's a great mission, and you you seem to be doing fairly well. You're listening to the Over 50 You Are Not Done Yet show. A little room that uh, I'm in, and you call it, one of my daughters called it a monastic cell, (laughs) you know, (laughs) because I'm here alone, it's a solitude. Yes. And uh, and so these are, uh, once a month I, I write something called Musings, musings from the monastic self. And I just tell some stories about, well, the, the fact that uh, right now, in, uh, in, in out, outside the, the, uh, uh, the back uh, spacious lawn that my, my son has, and looking at from the deck, uh, uh, deer are coming out. Mm-hmm. And so I, I tell about that, and I tell about what's happening to us. And the trees are dropping the acorns, and so the deer are coming in to, to uh, eat the air, gobble up the uh, acorns, of course. And that sort of thing, I, I write that. Plus, plus, what's happening in the family? Somebody got engaged, or somebody. Mm-hmm. One uh, granddaughter, uh, for example, my, bro- my brother's uh, daughter, uh, she's, she's becoming an NMD. Now, wow. She won an award in her medical. And that, and that, of course, uh, and, and, and these opportunities to write uh, just uh, seem to pop up. I don't, I don't seek them out. They just come and seek me. <laughs> yes, you're being called. <laughs> I hope that those listening uh, realize that everyone needs a Joaquin. You know, like your Joaquin, that kind of pushes you to write that next book and supports you in uh, continuing to feed the muse. <laughs> More people entering retirement, about to retire, need and and should have someone that says you can do it. Oh, absolutely, uh, Nadine. That, that's absolutely true. Uh, uh, you, you need a mentor, and I never had one. I, and um, until Joaquin, just by just by accident, he he came and interviewed me uh, for a story he was doing of his own. Mm-hmm. And then Joaquin, uh, uh, you know, uh, well, what would you like to do? And I told him, well, I, you know, all I think is I, I 
I wrote a little story about my life in India, my year in India. And he said, well, go and do it, go and do it. <laughs> Except for Joaquin, I would never have done it. Yes. Which brings me full circle to the fact that I wanted to do this podcast pretty much to just remind people you are not done yet. There's more in you. There's more that you could be doing. It, it seems very small. Oh, I'll just write a poem or whatever. But that poem has life from from your thought to putting it to the pen or typing it out in, in a computer and it touches other people's those words are your words you know that sound is your sound um that stroke from a brush on on canvas is your it comes from you and i just hope that anyone listening knows that they can do it it's up to you to take the first step and just looking at where you are right now it's it's inspiring um, because most people think, oh my goodness, I'm reaching retirement. Oh, my life's over. No, there's just so much more you can do. No question about it. In fact, in, in a sense, uh, your life is just sort of beginning because you, you can kind of either realize what, uh, what, what's available and and you realize what you can actually do. It's just what they did the book about 10 lessons I learned. Well, in the back, sure. in the very back of the book, now, Joaquin's uh, wife, uh, Marianne, mm-hmm. uh, did some uh, painting, some drawing, and and within within this, a poem by me. Well, I just happened to be sitting at the deck uh, having breakfast one morning, mm-hmm. and I and I thought these these thoughts. It's hard, hard to hear the silence of the morning in the glen, and that, but the mind forces you to hear. Ever so slightly, and, and, uh, it's hard, hard to hear the sounds of the morning in the glen, but mine forces you to hear ever so slightly a bird bed, a bird, bluebird in the bird bed, and a far red bellied woodpecker, or a chickadee chirping, and away above a, a plane descending, coming, coming home. Nadine, where all that came from, I don't have any idea. But I'm you, just sitting here, and, I, and it, it just popped out. But things that were, things that were, <laughs> and, and uh, Nadine, the muse took over. And above all, now, if you're, if you're talking to a retiree, mm-hmm. uh, you, you may well be. Mm-hmm. Uh, you, you're right, you're not done yet. You're, it's not all over. In fact, it's just, just you know, beginning. It's just starting because now you have uh, have a little bit of time. Yes. You're not you're you're not uh, burdened down with the twenty four seven work and sure. uh, you you have a little bit of time and so put your mind to work. You know and and let it let it let it go. And let it go. Yeah. Uh, Things will come to you. just just let it go. Let the uh, uh, some say. Let Open the door, let God in, or, you know, some of the religious people say. Nothing wrong with uh, that. And I, I hope you're uh, stimulating some, some people who might be sh- sort, of, sort of giving up, but why you don't give up? Yes, <laughs> I... You're that's... Uh, you're not done yet, isn't that what it is? You, you are, are not, not done, done yet. yet. You, you are not done yet. If I just touch one person, I've done my work. My name is Nadine O, and you've been listening to the Over 50 You Are Not Done Yet show. Until the next time, dream big, no dream bigger.